Thank you very much. After this introduction, I should better stop because it will be downhill from here on. Uh, uh, so this is going to be a, a sort of half review and half new science of our work on uh, molecular conduction. There is a, it is a collaborative project. There are many names to thank. Uh, uh, one of them, Durbare, uh, gave a poster yesterday. Uh, now, uh, this is what the schematic view is. We want to use molecules uh, as components uh, in uh, electronic devices. This is supposed to be an electronic device, and you see uh, the molecule there. Uh, there are many experiments. These are actually, this is an early slide. There are many more new experiments. There are many uh, uh, setups where people uh, put molecules between two macroscopic conductors. Uh, I, I don't know, is this working? Uh, uh, and measure uh, molecular response to bias and other triggers they put on the junctions. I'll tell you uh, some of them as we go along. Uh, uh, one of the main products are papers in Nature and Science, uh, but uh, there are actually some devices that, uh, uh, that, uh, that come uh, slowly uh, to be. If this was a talk on technology, then uh, I would highlight this uh, five things we uh, want to know about molecular conduction junctions. Uh, there is fabrication. Uh, I'm not involved. The, the closest I come to, to experimental work that uh, every now and then I, 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 I offer Ori Chesnovsky to kick his system where things do not work. Uh, and somehow he does not appreciate it as much as I thought he would. Uh, uh, but the, the other issues are uh, 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 what uh, uh, some of the fundamental research is, is, is concerned with stability of junctions, characterization, uh, functionality, and control. Uh, these are all issues of technology. And uh, when we uh, uh, hope to make devices uh, based on molecular uh, response to, to uh, electrical signals, these are the things we should worry about. Uh, our work in uh, uh, Tel Aviv University is concerned with the bi basic science uh, behind uh, these characteristics. Uh, there are really fundamental issues involved. The, the first one that I put here is probably the most important one. Uh, when we try to understand molecular junctions, basically we are trying to understand electronic systems uh, in systems which do not have a fixed given number of electrons. Uh, those of you who took a course uh, in uh, molecular electronic structure in, in quantum mechanics of atoms and molecules, know that the number of electrons in the system uh, is a given. It, it's, well, that's where you, this and the Hamiltonian is what you start with. Here we deal with systems which do not have a fixed number of electrons. Electrons go in and out all the time. We still need to know about uh, their electronic structure because they are the basis of all the other questions that arise here. Electron transfer processes, electron transmission through molecules, conduction when we put the molecule between two uh, uh, conductors, what are the parameters that affect these processes, uh, effect of the nuclear environment, this is this issue of elastic and inelastic uh, transmission, uh, coherent and non-coherent phenomena in molecular conductions, the issue of uh, developing heat uh, in the process, and possible interaction with light. All these are the fundamental questions that uh, uh, we are dealing with. And uh, since this is uh, uh, partly, as I said, a review uh, talk, and given the, the audience that come from very different disciplines, uh, also partly perhaps a tutorial, uh, uh, the, the way I want to present it to you, I will repeatedly come to this issue of time scales because the competition in time within the different processes that affect the system is what really gives it its characteristic properties. Uh, so this is sort of a summary of what we know about time scale in 
molecular processes. The fastest one is the electronic motion. Uh, electronic motions occur on the sub femtosecond uh, time scales, uh, and uh, everything else is slower. What is everything else? There are nuclear motions, vibrational motions, there are energy transfer processes, proton transfer processes, uh, and very slow processes like torsional dynamics of org uh, organic and biological molecules. We are dealing with all these time scales where we deal in molecules, uh, including molecules in uh, conduction junctions. So, so, so the competition between them uh, will be very important. Uh, this is sort of an illustration why time scales are so important. If it is given to you that this bridge can last only for one second if the dog sits, uh, stands on it, if the dog goes slowly, it will never reach the hamburger. It has really to run very fast to cross the bridge before it falls down. And uh, uh, to, to be more scientific about it, just as an example, uh, I, I, I bring the problem of molecular vibrational relaxation. Uh, here you have a molecular vibration, and this is the spectrum of all the vibrations in the environment uh, around it. You know that the most important characteristics of vibrations in macroscopic environments is that the by frequency, the cutoff frequency, the highest frequency that can exist in vibrations of solids or, or liquids. And the time scale, of course, is inverse frequency. The question is whether the molecular vibration is larger or smaller than this highest frequency of, uh, of the environment. If it is smaller, then the process shows exponential relaxation. Typical time scale is about uh, one picosecond. And uh, uh, the, the, the theoreticians use the, the word white bath to, to say that there are all the frequencies are possible relative to the molecule at least, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, the Markovian limit of, of the relaxation processes. The names are not very important. Uh, on the other hand, in these situations where the highest vibration available to the environment is smaller than the molecular vibration, then we, saw, we see actually a rate which goes exponentially with the ratio between the molecular frequency and the Debye frequency. So, so the time scale really comes to, to this observation that the vibration relaxation rate almost does not depend on molecular frequency. It remains about one picosecond time scale as long as the molecular frequency is smaller than the highest uh, frequency of the environment. And then it goes exponentially down when uh, the molecular frequency becomes higher. And, and we see this in experiments all the time. Uh, this is an example here. Uh, uh, if we measure the vibration relaxation rate between these two levels, if this spacing is more than the Debye frequency, this will be slow. If this spacing is less than the Debye frequency, this will be fast. And uh, in fact, we see the fast processes and the slow processes, depending on whether you are at low vibrational state or at high vibrational state. I don't think we need more example than that. Electron transfer uh, is a, a, another process where time scales are really uh, the essence of the issue. The, the important point is that this is a process which involves both electronic transition and nuclear relaxation. Uh, electrons are much faster than nuclei, so the electronic transition occurs instantaneously relative to uh, nuclear time scales. And therefore, this process cannot occur. You see here, electron went from one side, uh, from one atom to another. The environment, the dipolar environment, is ordered accordingly. But if the process occurs instantaneously, uh, uh, sorry, the process cannot occur instantaneously in this way because the nuclear environment cannot rearrange itself on the same time scale as the electronic environment. Here, it appears as if both transitions, both the nuclear arrangement and the electronic transition occur together. Instead, what we have is first nuclear fluctuation that brings the two electronic states before and after the transition to be of the same energy, then electronic transition, and then nuclear relaxation back. And the reason you need this is that if you try to make this electronic transition without the nuclear uh, 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 rearrangement, energy will not be conserved. To take an electron from this atom to this atom without rearranging the nuclei 
will give you energy much higher, but you do not have this energy has to be conserved. So first you have to have nuclear fluctuation to make the two states, this and this, of the same energy, electronic transition, then relaxation. This is how electronic electron transfer occurs. It is very important to involve the nuclear environment, otherwise electron transfer cannot occur. So first we have to have nuclear motion, electronic transition, and nuclear motion again. Uh, schematically, uh, this appears like this. This is the electronic energy as a function of nuclear coordinate in the initial electronic state and in the final electronic state before electron transfer, after electron transfer. To go to transfer electron without moving nuclei will be to go from this point, if I start here, to this point. This is the nuclear coordinate. If nuclear, nuclei do not move, electron will go this way. We cannot go this way because this does not conserve energy. Electron cannot go up. There is no energy for this. So first, nuclei has to move until the two electronic states at this point are degenerate, and then electron will transfer, and then nuclei relax again. This is just the schematic view of what I said before. Given this schematic view, in fact, we can make a theory of electron transfer if we are Marcus, that is, in 1955. Uh, uh, Marcus analyzed this and got to evaluate the activation energy of this transition. The en Please pay attention. The activation energy of electron transfer process is not an electronic energy. Well, it is the electronic energy involving moving the nuclei. This is nuclear coordinate. So to go to the transition state, we do not move electrons, we move nuclei. Electron transition is dominated by nuclear motion. Marcus calculated this activation energy here. It is given in terms of the energies Ea and Eb of the two electronic states, and by a, a, a property of the solvent that is called reorganization energy, basically the energy that is involved if we move the electron instantaneously, what we cannot do, but if we did, could move it, then the reorganization energy is the relaxation energy, the distance between this point and this point involved in transition. So once we have an expression for the activation energy, we have a theory of electron transfer. We can go to Stockholm to collect the Nobel Prize, which is what Marcus did 20 years later. After this was, uh, 30 years later, after this was confirmed by experiment. What was confirmed by experiment is the fact that uh, you can predict how electron transfer rate will depend on the energy difference between the initial state, this Ea, and the final state, this Eb. It goes like this. This is an activation energy. If you increase the energy difference between the two states, you see the activation energy goes to zero. You increase it further, it becomes again finite. So you predict that the activation energy will go up and then down as a function of what you can think as the driving force, the energy difference between the two electronic states. This was confirmed by experiment. The, uh, the, the rate goes up, activation energy goes down, and then goes down again. Once this was uh, uh, shown in experiment 30 years after Marcus' theory, it was clear that Marcus uh, will get the Nobel Prize, which he did. So this is about electron transfer. This is a sort of introduction to molecular conduction. We are now back to conduction. And uh, in molecular conduction, uh, we do not really have to involve the nuclei. Uh, this is uh, the prototype on electronic relaxation process. If electron starts in state one, this is a molecular state, and these are states of the metal near the, uh, the, near the molecule, then if electron starts there, it can go to the continuum of states of the electronic states of the metal. Uh, and uh, the, the rate in which it goes is given by the golden rule. Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, you all know about the golden rule, the square of the coupling between the molecule and the metal, and the density of states of the electronic states of the metal. The process is exponential. Uh, uh, and that's sort of a fundamental of quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, the difference when the molecule is in, uh, near a metal 
is that some of these electronic states are occupied, in fact, states below the Fermi energy at zero temperature, all the states below the Fermi energy are, are occupied. Uh, the Fermi distribution, uh, as you know, is given by this, where this is the uh, Fermi energy or the chemical potentials of electrons in the, uh, uh, in the metal. So you can imagine that the kinetic may be a little different. The rate to go from this, from electron to go from this state into the metal will be given by this gamma, but with the probability that the state in the metal will be unoccupied, and the rate to go back from the metal to state one, to the molecular state, will be given by the same rate gamma times the probability that the state we start from was occupied. So if I want to make a theory of molecular conduction, if this is a metal, this is another metal, the molecule in between, I can do it like kinetics. The left metal give and take electron to the molecular state, the right metal do the same. I have these expressions for the rate, so I can calculate what will be the, uh, the, uh, the total uh, uh, current uh, given that the two Fermi energies on the left and on the right are different because I put bias between the left and right. And what I get from this kinetic scheme is this expression. So uh, basically just A going to B going to C, the simplest chemical kinetic scheme, will give you a theory for conduction. This is not uh, the full theory uh, because you did not involve quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics tell you that if I have a molecular state near a metal, because the lifetime of the electron on the molecule is finite, electron wants to go to the metal, quantum mechanics says that there is always a broadening involved. The energy of the state of the molecule is not well defined and there is going to be some Lorentzian broadening of this level. And when you involve quantum mechanics, you get a different expression than this. In fact, what you get is an integral over all energies because energy is not well defined anymore. And this term, which is basically the transmission from left to right, now involves different energies Still, the maximum is near the molecular energy, near state one, but these gammas, the lifetime of the electron to go to the left onto the right, these are the inverse lifetimes, gamma L and gamma R, they are involved in this transition. So here we have an expression for current as a function of voltage. The voltage is in the Fermi energies, in the chemical potentials in these factors, and uh, this is the theory, basic theory of molecular conduction uh, this is called the Landau theory, who was the first one to uh, derive these expressions. So if you have the Landau formula in this form, again, the bias potential appears here, uh, you can get a feeling of what molecular conduction is about. What you have in this integral is the difference between two Fermi functions. Each Fermi function is a step function. The step occurs determined by the potential on this particular electrode difference between two step function is such a function where the width is the phi is the potential, so this is the width of the difference between two Fermi functions at zero temperature. This is the, 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 the closest I could come in PowerPoint to represent this Lorentzian, so this is the, uh, 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 the Lorentzian, the transmission coefficient as a function of energy. When the two do not overlap, I will have zero or, well, in PowerPoint this is zero, but the real Laurentian will have something here also, so a very small conduction. Uh, if I want to get higher conduction, I have to have this situation where the difference between the two Fermi energies and this Laurentian will overlap each other. We can achieve it in two ways. One way is to take the molecular level and push it into the window between the two Fermi energy. This is the left metal, this is the Fermi energy, these are occupied states, these are unoccupied states, and this is a conducting state where the molecular level is in the window between this Fermi energy and this Fermi energy. The way we achieved it is by pushing the level down. You can do it by inducing with a gate potential. If you could build such a potential that will affect just the energy of the molecule, without affecting the electrodes, you could do it. 
And uh, for example, Shacha Richter in our department is doing these things now. Uh, other ways to put, to increase the bias until the difference between the two Fermi energies encompass the molecular level. This is another way to get conduction. In any of these cases, if you plot the current as a function of voltage, what you see is a step where the molecular level enters the Fermi uh, window. If you take derivative to get conduction, you see a peak. And if you actually do the experiment, this is the kind of thing you see. This is when the molecular energy is not in the window between the two Fermi levels. And when you increase the bias, you start seeing the molecular conduction. So uh, this is sort of an introduction. I want to come to our work. Uh, and our work deals with the effect of nuclear motions on these conduction uh, processes. Uh, when I told you in five minutes about the theory of electron transfer, I said nuclear motion is essential. Why is nuclear motion essential? Because if any electrons start here and go to another state, I need to stabilize the initial and the final state to get actually a rate. Otherwise, the electron will just oscillate between the two states all the time. There will not be a transition. Uh, so for electron transfer, I have to have the initial nuclear fluctuation. Electron then goes, and then the nuclear relaxation, the initial and final state have to be stabilized. For conduction, I do not need this, because electrons do not start here. Electron comes from the metal. and when it goes to the other side, it does not stay there. Therefore, it will not go back. It disappears into the other metal. So for molecular conduction, we do not really need a nuclear participation or nuclear relaxation. And in fact, uh, when we started to be interested in this problem uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, we did some numerical simulations to explain experimental results like this. This is uh, actually photo emission from platinum, platinum through uh, layers of water. In this case, this was D2O, but uh, I, I, and I forget why. Water will give the same uh, result. Basically, what uh, you see, what, what, what they look is at the kinetic energy distribution of the electrons going through the water layer during photo emission. And you see that when you take thicker and thicker water layers, the intensity of the photo emission goes down. But when you normalize all these lines to the same height, you see that the kinetic energy distribution did not change. So the picture is that the process is completely elastic. The intensity goes down because from a thicker layer, I will be reflected more efficiently and less electrons will go out. But the fact that the kinetic energy distribution does not change means that I did not give energy to the nuclei. So electrons are so light and so fast that they do not have time to exchange energy with the nuclei. And this is the paradigm uh, uh, with which we, we worked for several years uh, until we encountered the, a, a, a sort of a contradiction. Based on this idea that electrons do not exchange energy with the nuclei, we could do our simulations with frozen nuclei, nu nuclear configurations because the, the, the nuclei are so slow that on the time scale, of electronic motion, they do not move. So we did actually simulations of electron transmission through one or two or three water layers on a metal surface. Uh, and uh, basically, this is uh, what the electron sees when it tries to go through. This is a, a view from above the metal surface. And each one of these circles is the core of an oxygen atom, which is the main repulsive potential that the electron sees. Uh, and what we calculated is what is the effective barrier that the electron sees on its way out, how high it is. And uh, uh, so this is just details of the simulation. I will not go into it. Uh, what we found, this is actually the red line here. If we plot the effective barrier as a function of number of layers, we, to our surprise, we found that the effective barrier, in fact, goes down when you put more layers. Normally, you'll think either it should not change or maybe will go up, but why does it go down? So to sort of summarize what we observe, this is really what we see. If this is the barrier the electron sees with one water monolayer or even two, 
this is the kind of barrier he sees where there are more than two water monolayers. The reason why the effective barrier height is lower is that the electron does not have to go all the way above the barrier. It can tunnel through this intermediate supporting layer there. And in fact, we could identify in the water structures, if you want, impurities in the water, in the adsorbed water structures, places where a water molecule is missing, where the electron wave functions tend to get localized. So we actually see this kind of, of uh, schematics in the actual structure of water adsorbed on platinum surface. And this brings us to the questions, I remind you, my theme was to tell you about time scales and how they affect uh, the, the, the processes we, 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 we see. This is electron tunneling through a water layer on a metal surface. It's an interesting question, what is the tunneling time? How long does the electron spend in the barrier? And why this is important? Because our paradigm, the, the basic assumption we make is that electron goes through on a time scale much shorter than the nuclear time scale. So what is the time an electron spend in the barrier? In a classical process, you just take the length of the barrier and divide by the speed. And you could do it here and here, but when you have tunneling, there is no real speed. So the question is, what is the time the electron spend in the barrier? You have to estimate in some other way. And I will not tell you the details of the theory of traversal times. This is another Landauer together with Boutiker uh, theory. But I will show you the kind of result you get. If you have a simple tunneling through a square barrier, the square barrier is characterized by a width and a height, the tunneling time, the time the electron actually spends inside the barrier and then can interact with degrees of freedom like nuclear degrees of freedom there, is given by the width and the height and the energy of the electron and the mass of the electron. In this way, if you put characteristic numbers for molecular junctions, like electron going through a water layer, you calculate tunneling time of uh, about 10, 20, uh, 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 0.2 femtoseconds, uh, uh, which really tells you that the paradigm was correct, that, that electrons tunnel much faster than nuclear vibrations. The fastest nuclear vibrations are more like 10 femtoseconds. Uh, on the other hand, when we did this calculation of tunneling time through actual water layer, not square barrier, then we find that in some en energy range between zero and two electrons below the vacuum barrier, there are two metals. The vacuum barrier is determined by the work function. Within two electron watts below the uh, vacuum barrier, we calculate tunneling time, which is of the order of actually 10 femtoseconds. So again, because the electron tends to get captured in these resonance states I showed you before, water barrier does not appear as a square barrier. It appears as a double barrier, as a barrier with a well inside it and because the electron can get trapped, the tunneling times become longer. If the tunneling time is of order 10 femtoseconds, electron can interact with the nuclei. So about four years after we started our work on this subject, and during four years we always assumed that nuclear can be looked as frozen during the process of electron transport through a molecular environment, we suddenly realized that it's time to get interested in the interaction of electron with the nuclear environment and what does it do. And it turns out, uh, uh, well, this is actually a calculation of how much of the process of electron tunneling through water is inelastic. I will not go into that. Uh, it turns out that there is a lot you can learn by and, and, and actually do uh, with this issue of effect of nuclear dynamics on electron transmission uh, in molecular junctions. There are many, many processes. Uh, there is a list here, but I, I will highlight some of the points on this list uh, together with my original list of what is important for technology in molecular junctions. Like uh, this issue of inelastic tunneling spectroscopy. 
electron going through a molecular environment and excite molecular vibrations. And if we can see the signature of this excitation in the finite electron energy, we get information about the molecular vibrations in the junction. But in fact, in these molecular junctions, we can identify that there is a molecule in the junction. And what is the molecule uh, in the junction? It turns out that inelastic tiling spectroscopy is now the most important characterization tool in molecular junction. It tells us if there is a molecule and what is the molecule, if you can analyze the signal. I will show you an example in a moment. Uh, heating and heat conduction, if electrons transmit energy to the molecular vibrations, the temperature of the molecule goes up. This, of course, affects the, the problem of stability. In fact, there are many experiments where you set up a molecular junction, you don't see any signal, and when you go to investigate why, you, it turns out that you actually burned the molecule uh, during the process. Uh, we do not see much uh, literature on that if we look at literature on molecular conduction because people tend not to publish papers after they burn their junctions. Uh, uh, however, you see a lot of this where people actually do electron tunneling induced chemical processes. There is a, a, a body of work on this effect. If you think of a molecular junction operate at, say, one volt and show you a, a current of one nanoampere, uh, one nanoampere is 10 to the 10 electrons per second. 10 to the 10 electrons per second uh, uh, go through a potential bias of one volt. The energy involved is 10 to the 10 volts per second. Usually when I give this talk to physicists, I ask them now uh, how much energy you need to, to decompose, to burn a molecule. You all know that this is less than 10 electron volts, right? Uh, uh, so uh, less than 10 electron volts is enough to dissociate, to burn a molecule we have 10 to the 10 electron volts of energy per second going through the junction. You see that this issue of stability is potentially very important. We have to deal with it if we want to do something useful with molecular junction. Functionality. If you want to make devices, you want to make molecular junctions that will do something. The questions of heat rectification, heat engines, cooling, I will tell you just a little bit about this. A uh, multi-stability is the core of what can become a molecular uh, memory. This all comes from interactions of electrons uh, with the nuclear environment. I will say a couple of words on that. Uh, if we can harness light, if we can affect junctions with light, then we have a, a, another way for functionality and characterization and some work, including in this nano-institute, uh, uh, is being done today. Uh, so uh, let me just now tell you just a few words on some of these phenomena. Uh, inelastic electron tunneling spectroscopy, this is the process where you have between the two metals a molecule, and here I have the molecular vibration schematically appearing there. If I put a voltage just enough, if the electron charge times the voltage is enough to excite the molecular vibration, electron can lose energy, and the molecular vibration will be excited, and I will see current, but I will see some signature that will tell me that the tunneling occurred now with the electron losing energy on its way from left to right. In fact, this process is very similar to uh, what uh, is called Raman scattering, where I send not an electron, but a photon with a given frequency. And the photon that comes out can come at the same frequency. This is called relay scattering. Or it can come out with a smaller frequency by exciting a molecular vibration. So if this was a Raman scattering experiment, I expect to see in the scattered light a peak at the frequency of the incoming light. This is the elastic scattering, relay scattering. And another peak at a frequency which is shifted from the incident frequency, this is negative direction, sorry, uh, 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 by the frequency of the vibration. The difference between electron transmission and light scattering 
is that in light scattering we can resolve the energy of the incoming electron and the energy of the outgoing electron. In electron transmission we can do neither. Uh, so in fact we integrate over the energy of the incoming electron. This take this peak, make it into a step, but then we also have to integrate over the energy of the outgoing electron. This makes this step into a change of, sl of slope. So the signature of inelastic tunneling of electrons is a change of slope in the conduction versus voltage relative to intensity of scattering versus frequency. What people do when we, they plot their signal, they will take the second derivative of the current versus voltage. If you take second derivative, you go back to this signal. So this is how this appears in the second derivative of current with respect to voltage. You see peaks that correspond to molecular vibrations, and you can actually identify whether the molecule in the junction contains one deuterium, two deuteria, or none at all by the shifts in the molecular frequency. You, have, you can see that you have a molecule in the junction. You can see what the molecule in the junction is. Uh, so this is just a few words, well, just a few words on inelastic tiling spectroscopy. I want to tell you again just a few words on this issue of molecular heating. As I said, heating is a real problem. We can dissociate molecules by electron tunneling if the electron transfer enough energy to the molecule. If we want a stable junction, we have to have efficient heat conduction away from the junction to balance this heating. Uh, so any study of electron transmission through molecular junctions uh, needs also a parallel study of heat conduction through molecular junction, and this is uh, what uh, we did in the last few years. So this is the problem. I have a molecule. Uh, I can connect it to a hot bath and a cold bath and measure the heat conduction or, or calculate the heat conduction for molecules. Oops, this uh, should not have been there. Okay, this uh, is the kind of uh, this is the kind of results of numerical simulations we did on this problem. This is heat conduction as a function of molecular length. The molecule is is alkane, simple alkanes at various lengths. N is the number of carbon atoms. And what you see here are three phenomena, none of which is macroscopic. All these phenomena that you see here are characteristics of nanojunctions, length between, say, one and 100 angstroms between the hot and the cold bath. First is this rise. This is very small. It's completely quantum effect. I will tell you just one word about it in a moment. Then you see things go down. Another quantum effect, I will tell you about this. And then you see that the heat conduction becomes independent of molecular length. When you take the molecular length to be much, much larger, you will start to see the usual macroscopic phenomenon where the heat conduction goes down linearly with molecular length. All these lengths are shorter than the characteristic mean free path of vibrations of phonons going through molecules. When there are impurities and collisions, anharmonicity, everything else occurs at much longer wavelengths, and then we'll see the usual Fourier law of heat conduction. But we do not see it here. What do we see? We see, let, let's look at this first. The rate of energy transfer through the molecule goes down and then becomes independent of length. This is how this looks in an experiment. What uh, 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 this group in Gettingen did some years ago was to take an alkane chain between an anthracene and an azulene molecule, excite one of them vibrationally, and see the rate of, here is the time, the inverse rate, uh, the rate of vibrational energy transfer between the azulene and the anthracene as a function of the length of the alkane chain between them. You see that the time goes up and then becomes independent of the chain length. Time is in the rate. It is this thing. Rate goes down and then becomes independent of chain length. Here is another experiment. This was done a couple of years ago by a group in Urbana. Uh, 
what they have is a layer of, again, alkane molecules absorbed on gold. They flash hit the gold with a very short laser pulse. So they hit the gold and they measure the time it takes for the heat energy to reach to the outer, uh, outer bound of this molecular layer and they plot this time as a function of molecular length. If this is a diffusive process, then you see dependence of the square root of time. But what you see here is a linear dependence on time, which tells you this is a ballistic process, does not depend on the, mole the, the rate does not depend on molecular length. So uh, this we see this leg of the process. In fact, I do not have time to explain, but the saturation here is related to this fast drop in this leg. This very fast initial rise is not very important in this plot. You see it occurs only between one and two carbon atoms in the chain, but the prediction is it, that it will be much more pronounced uh, when you have very low temperatures, but this is just a prediction. This uh, it was not yet seen uh, experimentally. If you put a molecule in a junction and put voltage and pass current through the junction and calculate the temperature increase in the molecule, what you see are two steps in the increase. This is just a, a, an enlarged section of this point. There is one step of increase where the bias is just enough to excite a molecular vibration. There is another step of increase where the uh, bias is enough to actually, the green line is the current, where the molecular energy, electronic energy levels go into the Fermi window and the current goes up. So there is heat transfer into the molecule when we have enough energy in the bias to excite vibrations. There is another step where we have enough uh, bias to actually pass electrons, pass current through uh, the molecule. Can we measure this temperature rise? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Ori Kleshnovsky and Joram Zeltzer actually did in, in a very first type of experiment. You can do Raman scattering. Uh, you can, uh, you can uh, 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 look at the stocks and anti-stocks components of Raman scattering. Stocks is related to the light coming, uh, coming out at smaller frequency than the incident. Uh, anti-stocks is the light coming out at higher frequency than the incident. The ratio between them, as you see, is just the ratio between the population in the ground and uh, first excited vibrational level, which gives you access to the molecular temperature. So if you can do this stocks and anti-stocks scattering in the molecular junctions under current, you can actually measure the temperature of the molecule under current. The results were actually uh, uh, surprising in the sense that uh, this is uh, citing from uh, this experiment that was published in Nature two years ago. Uh, molecular starts to heat up, temperature goes up with bias, but there are events that, uh, there, there are sections of this plot, this is zero bias here, which indicate that the molecule can also cool down. You can interpret this downwards uh, downwards appearance in, in more than one way, but these experiments let us into thinking of the questions, can a molecule be cooled down by current, not only heat up? And it turns out that it can by several mechanisms. I'll tell you about one of them. If you have a bias in a junction where electrons go from left to right, this is the Fermi level higher here than here, electron goes to left, from left to right. But if there is an intermediate section where in order to go from left to right, at this point, the electron have to go up in energy between this level and this level, if a vibration couples to this intermediate section, then the electrons going, the overall current is from left to right. But here, there is an upwards energy uh, motion which can, take, can be assisted by taking energy out of the environment. And when you do the calculation, you found that actually this can be and you can cool down vibrations if they couple to this section of the process. I will not go uh, into detail there. 
I think since I want to stop in five minutes, I will not tell you about light. Let me just in uh, three minutes tell you about another process that we uh, uh, studied in the last uh, year or so. Uh, I told you about electron transfer, and I told you about electron transmission. Uh, I want to tell you just a few words about what I call current transfer. Current transfer I define as the transfer of electrons or, or any charge carriers. Transfer means it goes from this point to that point. But if in this region it moves, and if information about this motion is maintained in the transfer, basically I transfer current from this place to this place. So this will be now a phenomenon of current transfer. Uh, so uh, the simplest model for current transfer will be two coupled wires. If there is a current going in the donor and I can measure the current in the acceptor, if electron goes from wire D to wire A, will I see this electron moving from left to right in wire A if it was moving from left to right in wire D? If yes, then what I will see is current transfer. I can have more complex situation uh, like this one, if I have two rings, if I could induce the circular current in ring D, will I see a circular current in ring A? Or this is actually an experiment that was done. I will tell you about it in a moment. If ring D is here and I induce circular current in ring D, and ring D and ring A are connected by a, a, a helical molecule, this bridge assists electron transfer, but you see that the helical molecule now can be coupled not only to the location of the electron, but also to the circular orientation of its motion. This electron going this way will be coupled perhaps better to this helix than to the opposite helix. And if we could do such experiment, we could actually prove uh, uh, that current transfer exists. This is actually another type of experiment that was published uh, three years ago uh, in science. Uh, here we have a metal, uh, and you know that electrons outside the metals are bound to the metal by basically Coulombic forces. This is because of their image interaction uh, with the metal. So if I place an electron here, it can be in a bound state in this image potential. So, in fact, we can prepare such image states by exciting electrons from the metal into this image potential. Now, let me, I just invert the picture. So this is the metal, and I am putting electrons in the image state. You realize that an image state is localized only in the direction perpendicular to the surface. It can be completely delocalized in this direction. So I could use two photons, and there are techniques for doing this, to actually induce the image state with a particular motion along the metal surface. So now I create a current on the metal surface, and I can come with a third photon to photoemit this electron out. If I maintain information about the motion of this electron, I will see more electrons going in this direction than in this direction during the photoemission, and in fact, this is exactly what was seen in experiments. If I excite image states with electron going in this way, I will see more photoemission to that direction. If I excite them more to this side, I will see more electrons going in these directions. The thicker, the uh, red here is this uh, indication. I will not go uh, into details. Uh, these experiments that contain chiral bridges that I told you about were done by uh, David Waldeck and Ron Neyman. They put chiral uh, molecules on metal surface, do photoemission through the chiral motions, but if they excite the electrons in the metal by circularly polarized light, then the electron going out find it easier to go out through a molecule with this chirality if the electron is excited like this than with the molecule with the opposite chirality. And you see this different signal this is a demonstration of how this is done. If electrons go between this molecule and this metal surface through a chiral molecule, if I excite it with circularly polarized light, it will be 
different probab uh, transmission probabilities when the chirality of the excitation and the chirality of the molecules match to be in the same direction than in the opposite direction. I do not have time to tell you about the theory of this. Durba showed a little bit of this uh, in his uh, uh, flash presentation yesterday and in his poster. He showed actually a particular aspect of this. If I induce circular current here, you can imagine that maybe I will induce linear current there. So if this is an acceptor, if I induce a, do a circular donor state in this direction, I will reach more effectively to the acceptor than if I induce it in the opposite direction. In the same way, if there is a linear current going from left to right there, I may induce circular current in this ring, and this is what Durba told you about yesterday. Again, I want to jump to my conclusions. This is all you saw from Durba if you went to his poster. So this is what I told you about today. Uh, we are talking about systems far from equilibrium, most important systems open to electrons. So this is an electronic problem without a given number of electrons. Uh, we uh, show that the, pro the, the properties are derived from conformation, from electronic structure, and from interaction with the nuclear environment, which was the main uh, uh, issue I talked to you about today. There is a competition of time scale which determine what you see. How much nuclear response is there on the time scale of electron transmission? If there is much, there will be big effects, and we talked about some of them. Uh, we mentioned inelastic tunneling spectroscopy as a tool for characterization. We discussed heating and heat conduction uh, uh, as related to junction stability. Uh, functionality and control, we brought one example, cooling, but I did not go into details there. I did not have time to tell you about light. I said a few words about current transfer. Uh, usually when I give this talk uh, outside Israel, uh, I end with this transparency. I show them where tel what Tel Aviv University looks like and where is my office. Uh, here I just will thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a very nice combination of I will select, okay. Is there a coupling to the, to the molecule in the junction as well? Like phonons are coupled to the... No, no that right, okay. Surface and ice Raman, when it comes to molecules in, let us, as, as you well know, I, I, I excite plasmons and they interact with the molecules and eventually see an enhanced Raman signal. In fact, everything that has to do with light interacting with molecules will be enhanced because of the coupling to surface plasma. It includes every possible optical response by the molecule. It also includes the generation of heat and everything else. Yes. In a couple of the examples uh, that you gave, you talked about a circular current in a, a ring molecule. How can this be um, induced and how can it be measured? Well, uh, apparently, according to our understanding, it is much easier used than measured. Uh, uh, that is basically the uh, uh, Duba showed in his poster. Every time you pass current through molecules with ring, if you analyze the current distribution inside the molecule, you find that at some ranges of voltage, uh, there is circular current through this ring. So this is that. that seems to, they appear to, to always be induced. 
Uh, how to measure them is, 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 is much trickier. Uh, Duba had uh, a nice idea that in fact I saw it actually applied in a completely different system. Uh, if you induce circular current, you also induce local <coughs> magnetic field. Uh, and uh, uh, you can imagine that if I have two rings, uh, if I induce magnetic, if I, I induce local magnetic moments, I put an external magnetic field, these rings may, may respond to the magnetic field. In some instances where the current in this ring is opposite to current in the other ring, you might induce this type of motion and you will see the signal in the conduction of the molecule because if the current goes from in this direction, if the two rings are parallel or distorted relative to each other, this affects very, very strongly the conduction of the molecule. So in principle, this, this could be detected in practice. It was not yet. Yes. Uh, it's very interesting about the, the, now the problem of integrated circuits is the heating. This is some of the bottlenecks to faster computers. So I wonder if it seems like this is a real problem also in molecular electronics right from the beginning, unless this cooling phenomena, which I didn't understand. Maybe this cooling phenomena that you described can help in some? Uh, well, cooling is, uh, there are, you know, when, when you do theory, there is sort of a segment of your work which is uh, speculative. So uh, uh, I, I mentioned that the word heat rectification uh, at some point. This, uh, we, we, we wrote uh, a, a speculative uh, a paper on that uh, back in, uh, 2005, it remained a speculation for less than two years because it was observed uh, experimentally. You can actually rectify heat. Uh, cooling uh, is still a speculation unless we think that what Yoram uh, uh, and Ori saw is, is actual cooling, which, which neither they nor, nor, nor we really, really know. Maybe Ori want to make com comment on that. Uh, but I don't think you need cooling. Uh, what you need is efficient heat conduction. Because basically the, the, the temperature of a molecule in a junction is a balance between how much heat you put into it and how quickly the heat is going out. And it turns out that heat conduction through molecules can be quite efficient. In fact, uh, when the distances are not too, too large, basically if the molecular size is smaller than the phonon mean free path, then heat conduction through the molecule is ballistic and can be quite efficient. So, uh, in the one or two calculations we did of increase of, uh, of temperature of a molecule in a junction, it could go up to 1,000 degrees, but 1,000 degrees is not very hot for a molecule. It's maybe the third vibrational level. So, so uh, there are going to be effects of temperature, but you can maintain the integrity of the molecule in a junction, as we know, since we, we do experiments, and sometimes the molecule is not burned during the experiment. 1,000 degrees will destroy the contacts? It could destroy the contacts, except that the, this, this vibration does, is not uniform over all the junction. We talk about a vibration inside the molecule. Near the, near, near the metal, the temperature goes down considerably. But, but you have to worry about it. Uh, you, uh, Tamar Zeidman, I think she just arrived in Israel. She, she made, uh, for five years, they studied, in the past five years, they studied molecular dissociation due to electron tunneling through molecules. So if what you want are chemical reactions, you can get a lot of them as well. And this is really a balance between, again, the time the electrons spend in the molecule. If it goes very quickly from left to right, it will not excite vibrations. If it spends more time in the molecule, it can excite vibrations, and you can have both limits. One stability would like to bind the electron, the molecule to the electrodes. If you make it through chemical binding, then it's a new molecule. To what degree that interferes with the basic theory that you have introduced? Uh, if I just take the metal and the molecule, 
if I did the exact electronic structure and conformation of the molecule at some we do, we do not. Then I will still have an entity which has a metal in this side, another metal in that side, and something that used to be a molecule and now it's something else in between, but as far as the calculation goes and the type of results, uh, there will be no, no difference. What we normally expect is that if the coupling is large, then two things happen. The current can be much higher, and therefore heat deposited can be much larger. But also the thermal contact is, is, is stronger, and therefore heat conduction away will also be stronger. And again, it would be a question of balance, and, and this is, has to be resolved in an actual calculation. So now you, 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 you give me a chance to explain. I, I showed, if you think of the heat transfer as a function of the molecular length. So I said, at the very initially there is a rise, which actually becomes very pronounced at very low temperatures. Now why is there a rise? Because at very low temperatures, only very low vibrations can take energy. This is quantum mechanics. And short molecules do not have such low vibrations. When you go to longer and longer molecules, you have lower and lower vibrations. So longer molecules will conduct better at low temperatures. This is one aspect of the process. Then there is a reduction. Why is there a reduction? Because some vibrations are localized and some are delocalized. Those vibrations which are localized have a, some characteristic localization length. As the molecular lengths become longer than this localization length, you lose these modes. This is why it goes down. And then it becomes independent of length. These are the delocalized modes. So this is a summary of what ballistic conduction is. Okay. I just did. No, I know. I know that you did. But in a real life, I mean, how is it working? The well, the going down was observed. The independence of length was observed. The going up was not observed. Nobody did low temperature experiments mm -hmm. in this lab. Okay, thank you. So just uh, to keep uh, the other questions, and thank uh, Abraham again for the אין הפסקה כרגע, ההפסקה אחרי שתי הרצאות ואז קפה. תתאפקו עוד קצת. אוקיי, so I'm replacing Elas Klen, who unfortunately returned ill from Hungary from a mumia excavation, so we all send her our best wishes. It's a pleasure for me to chair the next session. Uh, the beauty of this conference is it's multidisciplinarity, so we're moving a bit to biology now. And the first speaker is from the department.